you have your Bible in front of you, I would encourage you to have it open. Have it open to Genesis chapter 2, where it was just read just a moment ago. We started a series, oh, I think it was, I don't remember, it was before camp sometime, so May, maybe, (laughs) something like that. Uh, We started a series entitled, uh, Why We Believe in blank. And we've covered a couple of things uh, as a congregation that I, that I feel that is important that we believe, a couple of really important subjects. And what I wanted to do this week was address why we believe in God's plan for marriage. If you go to the world around us and look for advice on marriage, it's highly suspect. If we human beings were so good at marriage, why are there entire shelves of books in bookstores entitled Marriage Help? We're not so good at it, at least as a world and as a people. And I'm here today to tell you that if you go looking for controversy regarding what you believe in terms of marriage, it's not hard to find. There are entire, and this is, this was unknown to me, but it's just uh, an eye-opening thing, there are entire Websites devoted to exposing specific errors regarding marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And I have to admit, I wasted a great deal of time reading some of that material. (laughs) It's like, wow, you know. What I want to do this morning is go back to the Scripture. I want to look at what the Bible says about what God's plan for marriage is. And I want to start in Genesis chapter 2. You know me, I'm prone to go to the Old Testament if I have an opportunity. I want to look at God's plan for marriage in Genesis chapter 2 first of all. As was read just a second ago, the man Adam and the woman Eve were brought together in the garden. And that's really where God's plan for marriage begins. God was the one who designed it who created it, and it's God that knows best how it should work and how it should function. And I want to look at that first of all. I also want to notice as we move through the Old Testament, specifically to the law of Moses, that divorce was a known issue in Israel. It's not an issue that was uh, prohibited specifically, as in thou shalt not, but I want to notice as we move through the law that divorce was not something that was looked upon favorably. And even the sort of negative connotations that divorce have in the Old Testament, that just pales in comparison to what's found in Malachi chapter 2. When God, with the exiles and with the really unfaithful Israelites, pointed out not one but two issues they were having in terms of their marriages. By the time we get to Jesus, the three synoptic Gospels mainly, Jesus takes what has been done to marriage, specifically what the Jews believed about it and what they believed about the idea of divorce, Jesus takes this and puts it back where it belongs. And as Christians, as followers of the Christ, we're to be people that feel and believe and practice and preach what Jesus did in terms of our marriages. And so following all that, we'll have a few things to look at first of all, or a few considerations, or four of them specifically we can make from that specific study. But let's look at Genesis 2. Genesis 2, the conclusion of the process by which Eve is created, is the place where in verse 21, God calls the rib, to, or not the rib to fall asleep, He calls the man to fall asleep, and then He took the rib out and made the woman from it. She is presented to Adam. I would have loved to have seen the look on Adam's face. I mean, let's, he just got done looking at rhinoceroses and peacocks and, you know, frogs. And out walks the woman. There's that scene uh, just before every marriage where the man gets to see the bride for the first time. Fellas, you've never seen one like this. Because I guarantee you, your bride did not walk into the room naked. But God brings Eve to the man. And the man is not uncertain about what needs to happen. Or of who she is. He says in verse 23, This at last is bone of my bones. This is like, I've been looking for you. And flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Verse 24, therefore. Because of this, here's what needs to happen. 
Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. When God instituted the idea of marriage, there were four simple things that had to happen. Number one, you have to leave. This is advice that needs to be taken seriously by both the husband and the wife. There is a requirement, there's a responsibility that both parties in the marriage leave their home. And not just leave as in I'm going to move out, but leave in terms of they're going out to establish their new family. They're not going to be subject to what the parents will on either side. There certainly is advice. There's certainly submission to parents still there. But the Scripture teaches a leaving that has to happen. Now, Adam doesn't have a father yet, or really at all. This is a prescription for something moving forward. But they are told to leave father and mother. The old versions would say cleave to his wife. Cleaving, that idea, that word that really means to glue or to cement or to weld or to, you know, attach oneself to another. Permanently. Leaving and cleaving. But then the cleaving has to become something a little more than just being bound together. Imagine, if you will, I didn't do this beforehand, so I'm going to waste 10 seconds to do this. Imagine the husband and the wife, they have separated. You notice they're different. They're not the same, but they're compatible, right? And then they leave father and mother, and then they cleave together. Well, what would happen next? They need to be so tightly bound, so closely unified that the distance and the separation between them begins to fade. They begin literally like two trees planted side by side to grow into one another. To become one person. So close that one can finish the other one's sentences, and sometimes that gets on our nerves. So close that if you ask the opinion of one, you automatically know the opinion of the other. So close that separating them would cause great injury to both. Leave father and mother and cling or cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The one flesh idea isn't limited to, well, they're going to be biologically compatible and they're going to come together intimately in that setting. They're going to come together and become one person. And in that unity, they're able to experience and enjoy intimacy on a physical level, but also on an emotional level. They're going to be able to enjoy one another's company. There was a TV show not long ago called Naked and Afraid. This is not the way marriage was supposed to be. Naked and unashamed. Because there is nothing shameful going on. The Hebrew writer would describe the marriage bed as undefiled, you remember. Nothing shameful. Nothing embarrassing. Certainly private. But they're to enjoy that relationship together and to grow close to each other and to be so tightly knit together that to separate them would take a great deal of force and violence. Well, it isn't long in the biblical story before marriage begins to be distorted. The fourth chapter of Genesis records a man who had two wives and he's not necessarily a good person either. But as we move forward through the biblical account and we get to the law of Moses... Again, there is no thou shalt or thou shalt not for marriage. But divorce is mentioned frequently enough and with enough surrounding information that we begin to see that it was a problem in Israel. Divorce wasn't a blessing to the Israelites. It was a known issue and it was an issue that would raise its head in certain situations that had to be dealt with. For instance, in Leviticus chapter 21, in the requirements for the priests and whom they could marry, Priest, in terms of just a regular priest, not the high priest, that has a special requirement, but a priest in Israel was only allowed to marry one of two types of women. One, a virgin, or two, a widow. A widow whose reputation is above reproach. Everyone else 
whether it be a prostitute who shouldn't exist in Israel, by the way, in the first place, or an unclean woman, or a profaned woman. But included in that list in Leviticus 21 is divorced women. Now, as I say that, please understand me clearly. I don't mean to say that because divorced women are included in Leviticus 21 that divorced women are necessarily immoral. That's not the case. It was often enough the case, often enough the case, that priests were not allowed to marry women who had been divorced. Farther along in that same chapter, in verse 14, the high priest had an additional requirement. He wasn't allowed to even marry a widow. It was a known issue and an opportunity for a problem to come up in terms of the priesthood. And you remember they're, they're, they have a heightened uh, holiness that they need to practice. Farther along in the law, in Numbers chapter 30, when the requirements for swearing of vows were given and the restrictions on that, the law stood in Israel that if a husband and wife were married and the wife swore a vow, and let's say it's ill-advised, it's done in emotion, it's done for a poor reason, then in that situation, the husband could step up and say, no, that's not binding, I'm taking over, that doesn't count. That's the shorthand version of what's there. But in verse 9, a divorced woman, because she has no husband, and because there's, because there's no husband, there's no one to mitigate, there's no one to step in and really you know, uh, take care of this, her vow was binding. Now that doesn't point negatively or positively to divorce, but it does highlight the fact that it is a known issue in Israel. In Deuteronomy 22, the two laws we have concerning divorce restrict it and forbid it in a couple of very interesting situations. In Deuteronomy chapter 2, beginning there in verse 13, if a husband accused his wife of being unfaithful to him, or rather, I said that poorly, if a husband accused his wife of having been defiled before their marriage, let's say she was supposed to be a virgin and she wasn't, or he claims that to be the case, when the evidence is brought out proving that she was in fact pure, the husband is forbidden in verse 19 from ever divorcing her. And when you look in the context, you begin to understand why. For a husband to accuse his wife of such, such gross immorality, it would ruin her forever. And if he are allowed to separate from her, she'll never find another husband. She's vulnerable. She's out of her father's house and she's out of her husband's house. She's by herself and alone. And so God doing what God always does is protect the vulnerable. It says, you can never divorce her all of your days. Same situation is true later on in the chapter. If a man finds a woman who is engaged and he essentially rapes her, takes advantage of her, then he has to marry her and he is forbidden from divorcing her all of his days. And really the reason is the same for that. Because he's violated her, she's now in a vulnerable position. And because of that, the husband is forbidden from doing this. Deuteronomy 24 is the key passage in the law regarding divorce, probably the place where it's spoken about most at length. If you have your Bible, you can have it open there. Deuteronomy 24, beginning there in verse 1. You've got to understand when you read the law, sometimes the law does say thou shalt and thou shalt not, but sometimes the law gives you a situation and then makes a judgment regarding that situation. It's kind of like, here's a precedent, or here's an example for you, and here's how you should judge according to the example. In Deuteronomy 24, what I want you to notice first of all, is that the first two verses highlight a really terrible situation. This isn't a situation we look at and go, oh, well, this seems to be a good idea. Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, when a man takes, his, takes a wife and marries her, if then she, he, she finds no favor in his eyes because he's found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house. And if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of her house, his house, or if the latter man dies who took her to be his wife. 
Nothing's going well in those two verses. This is a disaster. This isn't one flesh. This isn't leave, cleave, unite, and enjoy your, your, you know, being united. This is a law preventing further damage. This is a law trying to bound something that has gotten loose. It's providing guidance for a horrible situation. And to prevent this situation from causing further immorality, by the way, well, I mean, can you imagine the, first, the wife going back to the first husband having also been with the second husband and then you've got really terrible stuff going on? To prevent something worse from happening, she is forbidden from going back to the first husband. Notice how it's described there in verse 4. <laughs> he reads it far better than I do. Hey, <laughs> he reads it. Notice verse 4 with me. God says the wife can't go back to the first husband because, for one, she's been defiled. For secondly, for that it's an abomination before the Lord. The same language used to describe rape and incest and many other horrible things are used to describe this. And you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. This isn't a prescription for divorce. This is damage control. In, in his commentary on Matthew, which is uh, in most, account, most cases quite good, uh, N.T. Wright puts it this way. And you remember, this was the passage quoted in Matthew 19, which we're going to get to in a moment. But in his commentary on Matthew 19, N.T. Wright put it this way. He said, The Deuteronomic legislation is a response to human failure. An attempt to bring order to an already unideal situation caused by human, quote, hardness of heart. You remember that's the thing Jesus said in Matthew 19. Because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses allowed this. He goes on, it was the fact that divorce was already taking place in defiance to God's stated intention for marriage that made it necessary for Moses to make appropriate provision. But it should never have been so. The existence of divorce legislation is a pointer not to divine approval, but to human sinfulness. Further along in that same passage, it was a mark of divine condescension. Even after His people had rejected His design for marriage, God gave them laws to enable them to make the best of a bad job. But the Mosaic, quote, permission was not a statement of the way God intended things to be. To see this most clearly, take your Bible and open it to Malachi chapter 2. Easy way to do that is open it to Matthew and then back up a couple pages. In Malachi chapter 2, the prophet Malachi is sent to Judah. And he... There is a lot going on. Malachi is not a long book, but there are some rather strong rebukes in that section. Uh, the priesthood is rebuked. The, uh, the, the practice of offering defiled, un, you know, unworthy sacrifices is rebuked. In chapter 2, beginning in verse 10, two separate things are rebuked. For one, beginning in chapter 2 and verse 10, leading down through verse 12, Israel is marrying outside of Israel. Israel is marrying foreign wives. They're marrying people outside the nation of Israel, wives who practice any and all kinds of idolatry. And, and Malachi rebukes them for this in verses 2 through 12. When you get to verse 13, Malachi says, And the second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because He no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, Why does He not? They're coming before the Lord with worship and the Lord's not interested in it. And they're like, well, what's the problem? He continues. Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you've been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Notice verse 15. It should sound familiar. Did He not make them one? 
with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. The ESV says, So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. If your translation says something slightly different, I'm going to address that in just a second, but I want you to notice what the Lord called it. The ESV says, the one who does not love his wife but divorces her covers his garment with violence. That is as graphic as you can imagine it to be. The definition of violence, I think, aptly describes what happens when a divorce occurs. The word, or at least the noun of violence, one of the definitions, the use of physical force so as to injure, abuse, damage, or destroy. An instance of violent treatment or procedure. Injury as, as, or, by, as by or as if by. Distortion, infringement, or profanation. My family has seen divorce firsthand. A lot of your families have too. You know as well as I do, those are the perfect words to describe divorce. While it may not be physical, and heaven forbid if it is physical, it is something that injures, it is an abuse, it causes damage you can't imagine, and it destroys families. Our world looks at divorce as a solution, as an easy way out. Saying divorce is a solution is like saying amputation is a solution. It might be, and there may be an instance in which it is, but there is always a scar. There's always a loss. And it is something that I think is aptly described in the last line of the definition, an undue alteration. There is some discussion as to what is the best way to translate verse 16. The King James, the New King James, and, and translations that follow that line would use the familiar line for, I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. This is the New American Standard Version, but it goes on to say, "In him who covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of armies. Whichever one of these is in your Bible, neither of them are good. Both of them show what divorce does. They show it as the awful thing that it is. Perhaps necessary in a very limited circumstance. But not without pain and not without violence. When Jesus arrives on the scene in Matthew chapter 5, you might remember the opening, the opening section of the Sermon on the Mount is a series of similar teachings. Jesus opens the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, after the Beatitudes and after the expression of being salt and light, and after really clarifying His purpose, He did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He begins in verse 21 of Matthew 5, with a series of teachings that all begin the same way. You have heard that this was said, but I say to you, and then you have the correction, or the return to the original intent, to the original meaning of what was taught. And he does this several times. In Matthew 5 and verse, 20, in verse 31, one of the shortest of these sorts of statements, Jesus says, you've heard it said, or it was also said, quote, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. That should sound familiar. We read that passage. But in verse 32, Jesus says, But I say to you, that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. 
In essence, the Jews had been saying among yourselves, listen, if you want a divorce, just make sure you have the proper paperwork. Make sure you have it written down. That way everyone's clear on what has happened. Jesus rejects this. Boldly declaring, and you might remember the way, they, the, the way they looked at his teaching at the end of Matthew 7. They looked at it as one who had authority. They were shocked by this. Jesus says boldly, that's not the case. Unless sexual immorality has occurred, something he's going to come back to in chapter 19, unless that has occurred, both the one who divorces and whomever marries the divorced person are going to be guilty of adultery. Something that you might remember under the law of Moses was punishable by death. And you can imagine this might have upset a few people. Namely, the Jews who were having a great argument as to whether or not one could divorce for any cause. In Jesus' time, then the Jewish uh, schools of thought, and there were basically two of them, you had the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai. The school of Hillel interpreted Deuteronomy 24, verse 2, or verse 1 rather, the phrase where if he finds some indecency in her. The school of Hillel looked at this, this line out of Deuteronomy 24 and said, some indecency? Well, that could be anything. She could burn the unleavened bread. She could do something and it would be interpreted as a, quote, indecency. And if that's the case, yes, you can divorce. In essence, divorce for any cause, which is exactly what they're going to bring up in just a moment. The school of Shammai was more restrictive. They interpreted Deuteronomy 24 to say, well, it has to be sexual immorality. And we're going to talk more about how Jesus decided this. When the Jews come up to Jesus in Matthew 19 and verse 3, specifically the Jewish religious leaders, the Pharisees, they come up to Jesus and they ask a rather pointed question. Verse 3, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Anytime Jesus begins an answer with, have you not read? We need to take note ourselves. Because sometimes we pride ourselves on the people who have read, being the people who have read. Being the people who have read does not inoculate us from seeing it poorly or badly or wrongly. They were concerned whether or not they could divorce someone for any cause. And Jesus backs up one step and says, no, you've missed the point entirely. You're assuming divorce is okay in the first place. Have you not read that He who created them from the beginning created them male and female, or made them male and female, and said, quote, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. It's a direct quotation from Genesis 2. Verse 6, So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Now he gets to the point at the end of verse 6. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. The Pharisees show up to Jesus and say, hey, can we divorce for any reason? Jesus says, no, you need to back up one step. You can't divorce, period. So then they bring up their proof text. But what about Deuteronomy 24? Why did Moses say, command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? Jesus sets them straight. He says, let me tell you why of your hardness of heart. The same phrase you might remember was attributed to Pharaoh. Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Now understand who is saying that. This is the same one who in Genesis chapter 1 said, let us make man in our image. He was there. He was there when the man and the woman were both created from dust. He was there when Eve was brought to Adam. He saw the look on Adam's face. He saw the look on Eve's face. He saw the look on both their faces. He was there when marriage was created. 
he's not just looking back and saying, hey, back there in the Bible it wasn't so. He's saying back there when I was, when I was there, it wasn't that way. He continues, and I say to you, repeating his point from Matthew 5, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. In Mark's version of the conversation, understandably, well, it's interesting that in Matthew's version, the disciples come back with, well, if this is the case, it's better not to marry. Maybe. In Mark's version, when the disciples come back and ask him again about the matter, and I mean, wouldn't you? When the disciples come in and ask him, Jesus reiterates the same thing and he makes it even stronger. You might notice in the first two examples, it's worded from one side of the marriage relationship. But in Mark 10, Jesus means says it's for the man and the woman. This is Mark 10 and verse 10. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. So that's the man divorcing the wife. And then he turns it around. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. It's the same in both directions. Luke's version, while much shorter, maintains the same teaching in Luke chapter 16 and verse 18. Now I know from reading all of those numerous sites that I haven't outlined every single possible question. We'd like to have lunch and supper today, so I'm going to stop here. But given what we've read so far, and I'm more than willing to address more questions privately, publicly, however you want to do it. We haven't touched 1 Corinthians 7. There's a few other passages we haven't dealt with. But I want to take from what we've read so far today and have some things we need to think about. Number one, given what we've read about marriage, doesn't it stand to reason that we choose who we marry wisely? If the plan for marriage is, as God said it to be, one man and one woman for life, it's a shorthand version of what's written in Romans 7 and verse 2, we need to be really, really careful about who we marry. I, I, used, I, I spent a great deal of time around, around teenagers. I was, a, I was a high school math teacher in a previous life, or previous work life, <laughs> put it that way. Uh, I, it's, it really is a, an old way, but... I used to just blow their minds because I would tell them, listen, this little relationship you have, it ends one of two ways. I said, you either get married or you break up. And they go, no, Mr. Sanders. I go, you got a third? <laughs> Relationships and dating and all that, it ends one of two ways. You marry or you don't. And we need to be looking at those relationships as we date at any age in that light. Is this a person that's going to help me get to heaven? Is this a person that I can be one flesh with, not just physically, but spiritually? Frederick did an awesome job of doing this, picking someone as really your, your soldier in arms, someone who is going to help you fight. We need to choose the person we marry very, very wisely. And having done that, be faithful. The plan is, according to our Lord, one man, one woman for life. The for life part matters. The till death do us part part is, is serious. It's significant. It's critically important. Malachi 2.16, 2, guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. We should read that at every wedding ceremony we go to. We read the, you know, love is kind, love is, but we read that one a lot. Read this one. Be faithful to your spouse. And in that same line of thinking, abhor divorce. 
hate divorce. I didn't say hate the divorcee. I didn't say it's never an option. But it is the last option. And it is an option that must only be exercised in one specific circumstance. When Jesus mentioned the idea of divorce, He was consistent in the situation that calls for it. Not that requires it. Couples can survive sexual immorality in one or both parties. But it just may be that the marriage cannot. And in that one specific circumstance where one of the two has let go, God in His mercy said the other party could let go too. And that's the way we need to look at it. When we talk about God's plan for marriage, when we teach our kids about what marriage should and is, should be and is, that's the way we need to describe it. It was our Lord and Savior that gave this as the reason for divorce. Marriage is such a special relationship that when God or when Paul by inspiration was describing the relationship of Jesus to his church in Ephesians the fifth chapter, he described it as a marriage, a union between a husband and a wife. And it's in that union that Jesus says or that Jesus will do, as it says in Ephesians 5 and verse 26, that He, speaking of Christ, that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word, so that He might present the church to Himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. You may be here today and you're looking at your life and you're thinking, you know, that doesn't describe me at this moment. I'm blemished. I'm sinful. I'm not a part of the body of Christ. I'm not a a member of the bride of Christ. I'm not a member of the church. I haven't obeyed the gospel. I haven't become a Christian. All those things describe the same situation. And without the cleansing of Jesus, there is no purity. There is no forgiveness. There is no hope. But in the same way that a husband and a wife share a unique intimacy... Christ and His church share a unique relationship. And it's not something you can have outside of Christ. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, or you have been unfaithful to the Christian walk, the remarkable description about God in the Old Testament is of Him like a husband waiting for His unfaithful bride to come home. Our God is gracious and forgiving to take you back if you'll go back to Him. It may be this morning that you want to obey the gospel or become a Christian or to return to that walk. Our God is faithful and just to forgive us. We're going to sing a song for your encouragement. If there's a way we can help you with that this morning, we ask you to come up while we stand, while we sing.